Okay, we're starting video nine in the Joseph H. Jackson testimony regarding what he found in Nauvoo, which sounds like it's probably worse than what they had in Jacob Bugath in the Book of Mormon with the Danites, Spiritual Wife System, and Council of Fifty. Start reading. Okay, you're hearing this on the Dodger Game channel, and you're in the Mormon Truth video library. So the MTV library, bringing the truth about Mormon doctrine, the changing doctrine, the contradictory statements on LDS.org, approved by the brethren as they change the doctrine, deny, decry, disavow, etc., and mislead. Not to mention the scriptures that are contradictory and the history that's been whitewashed. We get to the truth, we document it, and you figure out what to do with it. No sophistry here, just facts. And a little commentary. Just left of the subscription button, which I hope you'll hit, along with liking. You get into the channel, we've got over 70 videos. Okay, I found Joe in conversation with Emma, who was weeping bitterly. I asked Joe if he was engaged. He replied by telling me to walk into his council room, and he would be there presently. I accordingly, I accordingly went in and found Porter Rockwell sweeping the room. After I took my seat, Rockwell remarked that there was trouble in the camp. Yes, I said, uh, said I, yes, and it appears to be of a serious nature. Presently, Joe entered and took his seat beside me. He appeared vexed with Emma because she opposed him in his plans against law. He said she was mad because she could not get law for a spiritual husband and that he would be obliged to turn off to sick out his spiritual wives, turn out his spiritual wives that he kept about the house. Accordingly, in a few days, Joe broke up housekeeping and Ebenezer Robinson took the house. Joe and all his family boarded with him and thus ten or twelve poor females whom he had duped and some of whom really thought that he had had the Holy Ghost, they had had the Holy Ghost for a bedfellow, were turned out of, the, out of house and home to shift for themselves. Joe's reasons as given to the people for thus breaking up housekeeping was that he had too much business and had not time sufficient to attend to both household concerns and the affairs of the church, but to return to my conversation with Joe in the council room. He said that he had come to a firm determination that no traitor should live in the city, and that there were some in the country who, he said, should go by the board. He named Laws, Dr. and C.A. Foster, Higby, Kilburn of Fort Madison, Fleek of Keokuk, Sharp, Colonel Williams, H.T. Wilson, and A. Simpson, who, he said, were a pack of persecuting darned rascals and were continually sapping his heart's bloody his heart's blood by their influence and continued he I will prophesy in the name of God that every one of those darned vipers shall be cut off there said he I have said it in the name of Almighty God and one by one they shall be missing and my prophecy fulfilled to the letter now don't you oppose me for you will weaken my arm I scarcely knew which to be the most astonished at, the infernal villainy or the mad presumption of the wretch. He seemed to think that he could with perfect impunity rid the country of his enemies. I have no doubt that he could, so far as law is concerned, but past experience should have taught him to fear the vengeance of an excitable multitude. Okay, law is concerned. Law is not capitalized, so... Maybe he means the law rather than William Law, who he intended to get rid of. Okay, after giving me this caution, he remarked that if I would strengthen his arm, he would build me up in the world. It was shortly after this conversation that I commenced my opposition to him concerning his plot against law, William Law. This I did not, however, I did not do, however, until I saw his plan of operation was matured. When this was made apparent, I took a bold stand, and in the presence of his secret council and of several of his Danites, I denounced the plot as a foul, cowardly, and damnable piece of villainy. So when he says his secret council and several Danites, I'm thinking that means the Council of Fifty, as well as some Danites 
who some were part of the Council of Fifty and some were not. He soon saw that I was not what he had imagined me to be, and as a stepping stone, and as a stepping stone to the accomplishment of his great object, he laid a plot for my removal. He appeared, if anything, more friendly than ever, and I began to mistrust treachery, but for some time could get no evidence, until at last some of his women disclosed that a plot was on foot against me. In the, in the meantime, I endeavored to talk him out of his plot against law, and gave law a few hints of his danger, but not of a pointed or definite character, for fear that he would be hasty, yet sufficient to put him on his guard, in order that I might be able to get all the information I desired concerning the secret designs against me. I commenced a correspondence with Hiram Smith's daughter, and so completely won her confidence that she watched every movement and reported to me her observations. From her I obtained many valuable items, and amongst the rest the truth of a certain rumor that had been afloat in town concerning Joe's having feigned a revelation that he should have the wife of William Smith married to him spiritually. Uh, so that's his sister-in-law then. This was in the winter of 1842-3 while William was in the legislature, and previous to my last residence in Nauvoo. His wife wrote to him and told what overtures Joe had made, which greatly exasperated William and produced quite a disturbance in the holy city. When William returned to Nauvoo, he gave the, prophet, the people's prophet a grand flogging. Lavina, Hiram's daughter, in her conversation with me, declared the above statement true, and said that that was not the worst. I pressed her to tell me all, and finally she said that about the latter part of May 1844, Joe had feigned a revelation to have Mrs. Milligan, his own sister, married to him spiritually. This was just after William Smith had left Nauvoo to preside over a branch of the church at Philadelphia, Joe and he having hushed up their differences. This guy just never stops. When this revelation was made known to Mrs. Milligan, she wrote to William, giving an account of Joe's conduct, and said she should go back to the state of Maine and spend the summer. When she received an answer from William, she accordingly did go. In his answer, William gave Mrs. Milligan a good piece of advice concerning Lavina, and cautioned her not to let Joe get advantage of her. Previous, however, to this answer arriving, he had a revelation concerning Lavina, who was at the time living with him and attending on her grandmother. Lavina went to her aunt, Mrs. Milligan, for advice and inquired of her if this was lawful in the sight of God. Mrs. Milligan told her not to submit and wept bitterly to think Joe was so base as to try to seduce William's wife, then his own sister and lastly his niece. She advised Lavina to leave Joe's house and to shun it as she would a house of ill fame. Accordingly, Lavina did so. About this time I had a conversation with Joe, who, it will be recollected, still professed great friendship for me, doubtlessly for sinister purposes, which turned on the spiritual wife system, wife doctrine, the conversation did. Joe had been drinking quite freely and I broached the subject of the rumor concerning Mrs. Milligan and Lavina. Joe would not own that he had tried his own sister, but he confessed the whole matter in relation to Lavina, and said that he got Hiram to consent to it by giving him one of his spiritual girls, whom Hiram loved dearly, a Miss S. He said that he had lost Lavina by the foolishness of Clayton, that would be William Clayton, but said he, I'll have her yet. This William Clayton is one of Joe's private clerks and a ready cat's paw for all manner of base work. He has lived with his wife and his sister in and, and wife's sister in common for the last year. Yeah, we have that confirmed. And has children by both of them. This is the man who Joe had set to work to lead his niece into the paths of iniquity, aiding him by feigned revelations. But this innocent girl had timely warning from her aunt, who admonished her not to hearken to the foul counsels of her father and uncle, 
and was thus saved from the pit into which so many had fallen. In relation to Mrs. Millican, Millican, Mrs. Millican, I would observe that although not personally acquainted with her, I have frequently heard her spoken of by Joe's spiritual wives, who never failed to eulogize her as a noble and excellent woman. I have heard some of them say, after my depicting their desperate condition to them, Oh, that I had taken the advice of Mrs. Milligan, in the Jesus time. I might have then, have, I might then have been saved from all this infamy to which I am now reduced, from which it will appear that Lavina was not the first she had warned. Okay, so others have been warned, but fell into his trap anyway. As before stated, when Joe saw that I was in opposition to his dastardly and black-hearted measures concerning Law, William Law, he began a plot against my life, but having several confidence among the women, confidants, I kept the windward of him, but determined to leave the city as soon as I could settle some business that I had on hand. The first plot that I learned of was to get up a California expedition and murder me on the route. I had lived in California, and Joe knew that I had crossed the prairies. He therefore proposed to send under my direction a company of his Danites to California to explore the country and look out a situation for a branch of the church. This thing was talked of for several days without my suspecting the object. A certain lady, however, who had heard Joe, Hiram, and Dr. Richards in conversation, came to me and gave me to understand what was going on and told me that the plot was to get started and kill me and then return home and report that the Indians had shot their pilot and they were obliged to return. This, she declared, was the sole object of the California expedition and she made me swear that I would never divulge her name. She is a young lady and lives yet in Nauvoo and she is obliged to live there and I would be very sorry to give her any trouble while she is yet in bondage. I had good reason to believe this lady's statements, for they came from the purest motives, and as soon as I refused to go to California, the whole matter dropped, and I heard no more of the expedition. The next plot which I heard of was for Willard Richards to invite me to go with him hunting on the island. There several men were to be placed in ambush who would shoot me, and then Richards to run to the city and cry mob persecution, Missourians, etc. This plot was also revealed to me by a young lady who wished much to serve me. Shortly after this revelation, Richards met me on the street and proposed a hunting excursion on the island. I made an evasive reply and gave him a significant hint as to his object. Good grief. Another plot which was detected in the execution was this. I think I'll save that for the next video.